So we're talking here really probably to the PhD big book people, um, or if you're going to turn your, your thesis into a book, um, or you're going after you've actually done your papers and you've got it, quite often people want to, to keep working and get a book out of it. Um, then you may very well need a sustained time. That doesn't mean that you can't do a lot of regular writing in order to get to the point where you can actually do a bigger piece of work. Am I making that up? No, there's quite a lot of research around to suggest that this is actually what you need to do. Um, and, but it's also the case that um, we all work differently. Okay, so some people um, have longer regular writing periods than others. Some people can get by not having a regular writing time and they do try and actually find, you know, a big slab of time, which generally means they don't have any summer holidays at all. Um, but it's really up to you to try and look at how it is you can match the time that you've got, that whatever time you can manage every day, and those of you that have got little kids, it's often really hard to find a kind of a regular and consistent time when you can write, but if you can actually think about what are the tasks that you need to do um, when you've got a long, narrow strip of time and what do you actually need a bigger bit of time for and look at your calendar, see where, they're at, where you can get that kind of long, narrow strip and where you can get the bigger slabs. Um, because sometimes you actually do need um, a somewhat bigger bit of time. But just waiting till that happens um, doesn't, is, well, very, very rarely works. I can talk some more about that, but if you're interested in the question of writing and time, um, one thing you might want to look at is um, Helen Sword's most recent book, which is called Air and Light and Space and Time. Um, she's done a big survey of academic writers who she considered to be productive academic writers. Um, and interviewed um, 140 or so around the world about their academic writing habits. And she found that they, academic writers kind of fall into two categories. There are people who are planners and people who are, you know, right off the top of the head and then they spend a lot of time kind of pruning and crafting. Um, people who are planners also spend time crafting and pruning, but the work is different if you're doing a kind of spill, spill your head on the, on the page strategy as opposed to doing a lot of planning. Um, and sometimes I think there are people who do both of those things as well. So it's possibly not a kind of either or, I think, in the way that Helen presents. But there, there is research around um, setting up um, writing as a, as a habit. So that's, that's about trying to find a routine. A routine leads to habit, which leads to a practice. And actually, if, you're, if you are one of those people who is looking for a job um, in higher education or in a job where you're likely to have to do a rot, lot of writing, then having a writing practice is actually what you want to have. You don't want it to be a kind of tacked on bit of what you do. When I speak to academics and ask them what they do, they very often say to me, uh, oh, I'm a researcher or I'm a teacher or I'm a this or a that. Very few people actually talk about the writing. Very, very few academics actually talk about themselves as, have, as being writers and having a writing practice. So it, that's a kind of interesting thing, I think, to think about. We, we shovel writing away as if it's a kind of an extra part of the work when actually it's, it's an integral part of the work and we actually use writing to think. We write all the way through a research project um, right from the time that we start to conceive of what we might research, we're writing the entire way. So we use writing to help us, help us think. Um, and one of the dangers of thinking that we need to clear the decks is that actually we're also not thinking. If we're waiting to write, we're also actually waiting to do some of the hard thinking that we might need to do. I think another thing that we often worry about are hostile readers and hostile responses. Um, I think if you're a doctoral researcher working with a supervisor, particularly on a big book thesis, then this is less of an issue because your supervisors actually have got a strongly kind of pedagogical um, role in relation to you. They're going to give you fairly 
particularly if you're in education, I think they're, they're more likely to give you positive, constructive, formative kind of feedback, even if it's a terrible shock the first time you get a text back, which is covered with, you know, track changes. Um, it's it's um, well-intentioned, <laughs> um, as opposed to what actually might happen when you send a journal article out into the world, um, because um, not all, I'm sure, as many of you doing PhDs by publication have experienced, not all um, journal reviewers have pedagogical, um, good pedagogical intentions. Um, some of them actually don't even know what they're trying to get at. They know there's an issue there, but they don't know how to kind of explain it. Um, and the feedback that you get might be fairly crushing, and that's, of course, when you need to be able to work with your supervisor um, to kind of distance yourself from the process. Once you get over the kind of the shock and the horror um, of, the, of the feedback, then it's, you know, and you shovel it away in your drawer and you go and stamp and yell and do all that stuff that we all do, actually, and we all get rejections, including me. Um, it's, it's important to kind of put it out there and sort of have a look at what people have said. And if they've said something really stupid, so I've just had, you know, two uh, reviews back on a, on a paper, um, one of which had some quite helpful suggestions about some additional literature um, we might look at, and the other one, he missed the point altogether. Um, and it, it uh, you know, so having spent two days saying, I mean, I went say exactly what I said, but you know, what an idiot that person is. Um, <laughs> there are a few four, I'm Australian, there are a few four letter words in there. Um, you know, I then got to the point of saying, well, how could they make such a mistake? You know, what is there in the paper that we've done um, that would allow them to have that point of view? And we really don't want anybody else to entirely misread the paper in that way. So what can we put in now that will make sure nobody makes that kind of really stupid interpretation um, when it gets out into the world? So, you know, being able to actually process um, distance, process and reframe um, what it is that you're being told is, is really important in the writing process um, because that kind of, I mean, the academy is all about critical feedback. It's all about <laughs> interrogating your ideas. Um, people will always um, come up with a few things that you didn't think about. Um, usually, as in the case of Reviewer One in our reviews, it was very, it's very helpful. Um, but, you know, it's, it's important to, in this process, I think, to get support. So Theresa Lillis and Mary Jane Curry, who've written several books about um, people um, whose first language is not English, English, managing and getting on in the kind of global world <laughs> publishing industry, which is dominated by English language journals, talk about people having a public access to a publication broker. And a publication broker is someone who can firstly help you think about what journals you ought to choose and also um, uh, how, it, how it is that you might frame your paper so that it's, it, it means something to the people um, in a particular kind of journal community. They can also help you translate reviewer feedback, which is a little like real estate talk. You know, when it says, you know, um, um, need, needs, um, need, needs, 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 some, needs some renovation, um, you know, and you know it's going to be an absolute hovel when you go into it. It's, there's that kind of stuff that, off, that also goes on with reviews, that quite often you need some help from a kind of expert, um, um, more, someone who's more expert than you are um, in the field to actually help you kind of work out what's going on. Um, and while that doesn't mean the hostile readers go away, if you've actually got a process to manage it, then it's, um, it, you know, it's, it's, you know then it's something that you can actually deal with, even if it's scary, okay. Um, I think the next, the next thing, is the comparison thing, I think is, re is a really kind of toxic process, which, and I often see people um, in my doctor writing programs, uh, at, particularly the one I teach at Nottingham, um, people sort of looking at other people saying, oh, you know, they've finished their data analysis and now they're writing, I'm still doing my data analysis, when in actual fact they've been doing huge amounts of writing on the way and it's going to be quicker for them. It's actually like comparing um, the, the stage at which you're 
your your toddler talks or starts to walk. You know, they it, it happens. It just happens differently for different different kids, and it's a bit like that with uh, with. The, the research and writing process. There are, of course, now some imposed deadlines that you have to meet, so this is not an open-ended process, but actually spending a lot of time thinking about, you know, that you, you need to do this because someone else has actually done it better is really, is really not helpful at all. Um, and I think the, um, you know, the phrase that's up here, that good, enough, okay, fast, enough, that's actually what we have to kind of get into our head, that it's, it's not about am, am I as, as fast as someone else. I just want to say a little bit about um, impulsive phenomenon, which I think is fairly current in the kind of conversation. You'll hear a lot of people talking about this. Um, you'll hear a lot of people talk about it as imposter syndrome. Um, for those of you that read research, it's interesting to know that the person who, the woman um, who, the psychologist who actually worked on um, what she initially called imposter syndrome some 20 odd years ago, um, rejected the notion of it being a syndrome. And she talks about it as being a phenomena, which I think is more helpful than actually medicalising it and making it a kind of deficit condition, um, like a syndrome. But she talks about this kind of process of that a lot of people feel, I think, about feeling like an imposter. You know, you've, you've done your research for three years, you know, you've worked really hard at it, and when you're presenting it, you still think, they're going to find me out, someone's going to find out, I don't know as much about this as I, as I appear to, you know, I'm going to look like a, a right twit. Um, so, you know, the first thing I think to know is that this is very common. Um, and it's often common when you're starting out um, on something. So, you know, in the doctoral process, when you're starting to put your research out there, it's perfectly normal to feel that, you know, you, you're a bit tentative about, about actually get, getting the stuff going. And when my colleague Barbara Kamler, who I have done most of my work on academic writing with, um, when Barbara and I started working on academic writing in the late 90s, um, you know, we felt a bit like imposters, I have to say, because there, weren't, there wasn't a lot of other work going on at the time, particularly around doctoral writing. And we found a few other people. We found the wonderful Mike Rose at UCLA, um, and, uh, you know, who, who we had lots of really good conversations with, um, and the, the equally wonderful Anthony Perret, um, who's now at UBC. Um, and, you know, it, it was really having through those kind of conversations with people that we really respected that we started to get a sense that, um, no, actually, this, there is something in this and we really should, it's okay for us to keep going. Um, and, you know, that wasn't necessarily a particularly rational view on our part because I'd taught writing um, in schools and in community organisations and whatever for yonks and Barbara is a linguist and uh, a Hallidayan linguist and had done, you know, PhD, lots of research and that stuff. But when we were actually starting to work on doctoral writing, we thought, oh, you know, maybe, maybe this is not so... Not, we're not, we don't know as much as we think we might. So, you know... Getting, getting some support, again, um, from people who you respect. I mean, it's scary, actually, the first time you have a conversation with a big person on your reading list. Um, but, you know, it is actually a way to, um, I think, get into a kind of conversation which is much more equal, and I think that really helps with that sense of... Uh, of being an imposter. And it's actually not that irrational for people who are doing doctorates to feel uncertain, you know. I mean, why shouldn't you? You're, you're surrounded by people who've been doing what they've been doing for a long time, and you are having to learn to do new stuff, you know. Like the first time you say some of, some of those words, some of those terms that you've kind of read in texts, and then you actually have to kind of speak them out loud. You know, it can make you feel um, a bit silly. Um, 
but you know what's happening during the doctorate is that you're actually making very significant kind of shifts in your um, your identity and and in the way that you behave in the world, the way that you see the world, the way that you understand knowledge, um, the way that you understand the process of, uh, processes in which knowledge is made and communicated. These are all changing, and your view of who you are and what you can do um, is obviously shifting fairly rapidly, which is why I have to say, just as an aside, I always tell people that, you know, writing their literature review in year one is a mistake because, yes, you write your literature in year one, but the, the person in year three or year four is not the same person that you are in year one and actually that will show in the writing. That will show in the, the level of authority and the way in which you kind of analyse and manage the conversation will be quite different um, the longer you are in, in the doctorate. And I think as another kind of bit of reassurance, and you won't know this woman, but I'll tell you a little bit about her. She hasn't won a Nobel Prize, but she could. Um, she's, uh, I guess, to do the full European thing, she's uh, Dame Professor Dr. Athene Donald, who runs the Cavendish Laboratory in, at Cambridge. Um, she's a very eminent um, scientist. Um, Royal Society, all, all sorts of stuff. She regularly talks about her own feelings of being an imposter. Okay, so if anybody is not an imposter, it's, it's Athene, but she still experiences that. So understand that we all feel a bit vulnerable when we're putting it out there. Okay, and in the academic process of kind of putting it out there is relatively unusual, okay, in the way that we do. So and understand that it's not something that you experience, um, that yourself, by yourself, it's common, um, it's all over the place. So what Barbara and I would suggest and what we learnt to do was to say that we were still working out what we thought about doctoral writing. In fact, I mean, she has now retired and has stopped doing this work, but, you know, I very often when I appear before people like this, I mean, I probably will do it tomorrow, is to say, you know, this is where I am at the moment, this is kind of what I think about it, I learn all the time about academic writing, um, and it's okay not to know the lot, it's okay to, um, you know, get to be asked a question in a conference which makes you think, oh, okay, that's, that's an interesting question, and to have that kind of response rather than feel sort of defensive and, and found out. And I think ultimately, nobody knows anything uh, completely anymore. It's just not possible. Um, so, you know, understand that we're all kind of incomplete packages. Um, and I think that, you know, understanding that the practice of scholarship is actually more about not knowing than it is about knowing. We spend, ac academics, we spend most of our time not having a clue about the, our latest bit of research, okay? We don't know what it means, and we spend a lot of time occasionally getting a little glimpse of something, another bit more, and eventually something kind of emerges out of, provisional emerges out of the fog. And that's actually what um, research is about, because we're pushing all the time at the edges of what we know. We're not regurgitating what other people have done. We're trying to advance something, our understanding somewhere, um, often in collaboration with other people. So understanding that uncertainty is the kind of ontological position <laughs> is actually quite helpful. And understanding that that can be scary and having ways to kind of think about what you might um, do with that kind of fear is helpful. Um, if, you th if you look at how it is that actors um, control their nerves um, and how they use their nerves and work with it, that can be very instructive. I know some of you here are in the, in the arts. Um, it's not at all uncommon, I think, for people in, as part of their doctoral training to actually work with some drama practitioners and think about how it is um, that you deal with um, nerves and fear. How am I going for time? Okay. Right. So, as you're coming to the finishing line, 
<laughs> there are some big traps to watch out for, I think. Um, there's, here are only two that I heard uh, quite recently. Um, I, I just have to do another search of the literature to make sure there's nothing out there that I haven't got. Um, you know, goodbye another four weeks while somebody's kind of searching around. Um, you'll never read all the literature, OK? There's always going to be something else out there. At some point, you just have to stop and say, you know, that's it. Um, this is the literature I'm working with, and if the day before you you hand it in, there's you know the the text comes out that says exactly what you want to say, um, blink hard, go for a walk, and ignore it. Um, <laughs> because there's not a lot you can do at that point, you know. Some people manage to put in a bit of a postscript about something that's, you know, been published since they actually completed the PhD, if you've got a bit more than overnight. But, you know, essentially, the job is not really dependent on you um, knowing exactly what was published yesterday. Okay, it's actually about a kind of knowing the field and the body of work that's most related to your, to your study um, and being able to show that you can analyse it, evaluate it, frame your study using that literature. Um, so, yeah, um, if you do like keeping absolutely up to date, um, make sure your libraries have got the browsing. You know browsing? B-R-O-W-Z-I-N-E, -E, very nice little app which puts your library on your phone or your iPad or whatever. You can get a kind of daily, you can put about 40 journal, journals on it and get a kind of read of whatever's being published at any one time. If you actually happen to like that, um, being on top of what's being published in your area, um, I do and I look at it every day but then I'm rather sad about this kind of stuff. Um, I think the other thing is... You know, working on the craft of writing is really important. And actually, you know, my colleague Barbara is a poet um, and it's not uncommon for her to spend, you know, 10 months writing about 50 words. Um, you actually don't have that luxury. Um, so there's got to be a kind of balance between making what you've written kind of accessible, clear, not ambiguous, potentially a bit engaging, um, but it, every sentence doesn't have to be absolutely and completely perfect. And it's very easy to get um, held up on a sentence. So a lot of those people in the kind of writer's block people, you can see they just started writing one sense and sentence and then they screwed it up because, you know, was it hot or was it hot and wet or was it humid, okay? And you can do that and stop yourself getting on with things um, pretty easily. Um, it's, it's important to keep that kind of critical edge, what people call the inner editor. The inner editor is very helpful when you're revising and then when you're editing. But it's actually a really unhelpful little friend if you're in the process of generating text, of generating drafts. So it's about knowing as well um, not only that not all sentences are going to be fantastic um, in whatever you write, and I'm exactly that person who gets their shiny new book in their hands and go, oh, it's my new book, and opens to a page and goes, oh, God, this is a dreadful sent. How did I write that? Um, you know, there's always going to be that. But understand that being very worried about a sentence can really stop you. Um, actually getting on with the work. Um, and if you find yourself, you know, doing this, tossing it away, doing that, tossing it away, then the old habit of uh, shut up and write or free writing or Pomodoro writing or whatever you want to call it, timed writing, often to a prompt, is often the way that you can get past that. It's not a universal panacea for everything, but it can be quite helpful if you're having a bit of a problem actually getting going. Um, and it's very helpful for you to, um, I quite consciously, I think, develop a set of strategies about how you're going to manage your writing and how your writing can help you through the research process. 
So a very old book on writing a thesis by um, Sternberg. Um, he has, oh, by the way, is a file for everything, but he talks about the usefulness of having a ventilation file where rather than actually being stuck on a problem, you actually write about being stuck and you write about what the problem is. And very often in doing that, you actually write your way out of it um, or you see what the problem is. So he talks about, you know, and a place to kind of write down how you're feeling and your frustrations. And it's different from an ideas file where you're writing out, you know, things that you might follow up on or things that potential little ideas you've got about something. A ventilation file really is just somewhere where you kind of vent about things. Um, the, I've mentioned the others down to um, finding the lilt. Um, Jolie Jensen has written uh, a book this year about writing the PH, no, maybe it was the end of last year, can't remember, mental end note gone. Um, anyway, it's new, um, about writing the thesis. And she talks about, if you're stuck, about talking to somebody. She says, because when we talk to people um, and we get to something that we're interested in, our voice changes and we, it picks up and we get more energetic. And she calls that the lilt. And she says, you know, if you're stuck, get someone to listen to you and get them to hear when the lilt starts and then that's where you start. That's what you go for first, is you kind of go where the energy is. Um, and another strategy might be changing the kind of measures that you use to think about whether you've done anything uh, that's been worthwhile in that, that day or not. So I, I have a kind of mental word count for myself. Um, so if I spend a couple of hours um, sitting down, and I do try and do that most mornings actually, um, I expect to have written about a thousand words. And if I haven't written about a thousand words, and quite often more, um, if I haven't written about a thousand words, I feel like a complete failure, okay? I haven't, I haven't been productive. And a couple of weeks ago, I sat down and I, at the end of what I must say was about four hours, I had written, um, a, I'd increased the word count on what I was writing by about 400 words. And I, well, this is, I've been really completely unproductive here. Um, and that's because I was using my word count metric. In actual fact, what I'd done is I'd restructured the article. Right, and I'd, I'd cut some stuff out and put some new stuff in. So I'd actually done a mammoth piece of work, but using my metric of word count didn't actually allow me to see that. So quite often you just need to change the kind of rule that you've got in your head about what counts as productive. You know, some people have got time, I need to sit down and do this time uh, measure, you know, but you can actually be productive or very unproductive in, if you measure by time, the same as you can by words. So if you find yourself being stuck, um, it's about, I think, changing the metric. Okay, I'm nearly done. <laughs> okay. So, the, uh, the thesis. Um, I think that when you get really stuck, I think it's helpful to always focus on what it is you're actually going to say. Okay, so focus on the big reason that you're actually doing this. Um, I often tell people to, and I actually ask all the PhD people I work with to do this, to not only put their question up above their computer where they can see it all the time, but also to put down what they think their contribution is going to be. In other words, why they wanted to do this in the first place, because it was going to tell people X, Y and Z, which was going to be important. Okay, so actually hanging on to that can be kind of quite helpful, particularly when the going gets uh, a bit rugged, which it does for all of us some of the time. And I think the other thing is really to have an appreciation of what's happening when you're writing um, and what's actually going on. So my post this week on, on Patter um, is actually about um, six of six knowledge domains that are involved when people are doing a literature review. Okay, and that's not all, that's just six. Um, there's more than that. Um, it's very, it's, what we do is often very complicated work. Um, you know, we're not only learning and using, we're critiquing um, a lot of different kinds of knowledge that we're bringing together. Disciplinary knowledge, um, knowledge about the genre of writing we're doing, knowledge about the process of writing, knowledge about um, scholarly communities and the field we're working in. There's all sorts of stuff 
stuff sitting there when we're just doing something that appears to be, you know, the review of the literature, very misnamed bit of work, I think. It's very hard work, actually, working with the literatures, not only because we're using knowledge, but also we're establishing ourselves in relation to other people. If you haven't used it, there's a very good book by Grafen Birkenstein called They Say, I Say, which looks at the kind of um, rhetorical um, meta-commentary that people use when they engage with other people's texts um, and just show at the kind of quite small level. But looking at some of that and looking how it is that expert writers manage that process of being in control of other people's words um, and managing the reader's kind of steer through it, steering the reader through it, um, is very important. So understand that that's not simply working on text, that's working on establishing you as a particular kind of scholar who works with other people's work as well as your own in particular kind of ways. And understand that you don't do that as an isolated person. You are, you're in a kind of a set of very, you know, I mean, it's a word I'm going to talk, it's not a Russian dolls because there are kind of flows and, you know, all sorts of relationships that happen here. But, you know, you're working with disciplinary contexts, you're working with cultural contexts, you're working with higher education rules, you're working with higher education policy, you know, all sorts of things are actually, um, you know, a journal uh, costs about the number of words that you can actually have in a journal article. There's all sorts of things that are going on. Um, and, you know, that all sits there. Um, these kind of, and the, the sort of conversations that you're actually having with people through your writing, the kind of scholarly dialogue, the, um, the kind of intertextual references that you make, these are all kind of shaped and framed in a whole range of ways that it's actually helpful to try and understand. One of the reasons I get concerned about the kind of pan-European doctorate, I have to say, is because it kind of ignores cultural traditions. Um, and one of the things that I know is that, for example, my colleagues in Italy tell me that, if, that when they write in English, they feel as if they're talking down to their reader because they're going, firstly, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do that. See, I've done that. Now I'm going to do this. And that's not the convention at all um, that they come from. So, and they have to kind of unlearn that in order to publish in, in English. So that's one version of what kind of cultural tradition does. The other thing is if you're writing in English, and this is really a plea to all of you, there are concepts that you have in your traditions of education that you shouldn't give up just because you're trying to publish in English. There are really important concepts in, in European education traditions that you can't say simply in English. English doesn't have the words for them. There isn't that tradition of educational theorising. Uh, Bildung is an absolutely obvious one, okay, that, you know, there isn't a kind of an equivalent in English. So use the correct term and explain it. And this is a really really kind of live issue now in, uh, in publishing in particular, um, how much, um, e you know, Eng English, um, I guess the dominance of English language is going to give way and become more kind of intercultural and more respectful of other knowledge traditions. It's particularly important um, to Indigenous communities um, who uh, I think are very militant about trying to decolonise academic publishing, but it's actually relevant, very relevant in Europe. Um, and so thinking about, you know, the deeply philosophical Germanic kind of um, tradition of research compared to the very technical kind of approach that's now taken in Britain is something that I think we have to think about when we're thinking about um, what, what this kind of social discursive practice of academic writing is. And my final word is really read, read, read. Um, you get to be a better writer by doing a lot of reading and not simply reading in your subject area but actually reading all kinds of things um, just because they might be of interest. But actually, um, and then working out for yourself what do you think good academic writing is? What are the characteristics for you of good academic writing and how is it that you can work on your writing um, without getting into the writer's block situation to actually move towards what you consider to be the best
best writing um, that you read by other people. Thank you very much. I've, I've done. <laughs> You'll just want to go and have a nap now, don't you? <laughs> nap time. Has anyone got any questions? We have to stop? Okay, we're done. We're done. Okay, you, you can say that. Dear all, it's quite sad to say that this is session is the last one. We have had two intense and rich days with a huge, both intelligent and cultural inputs, and the sun and warmth input as well. I hope we have had an opportunity to get better known with each other. And we have already started to build our networks. Personally, I'm very grateful to have this valuable opportunity to meet so many professional, experienced, knowledgeable, and dedicated people. And I have an honor to introduce three of them for our last session. The first one, a person who has previously been working in the field of arts management in Norway. He began his career at the Beat 20 Ensemble and the Music Factory Festival and moved later to the administration of Norwegian National Company of Contemporary Dance. He worked as program coordinator at the Bergen until he started his PhD journey. This person plays the jazz piano and blues guitar in his spare time. Please welcome Eustein Kvinga. I would like to introduce another person. He is a PhD researcher in the University of Innsbruck, an LT program. This person has studied international and comparative education at Stockholm. He has a degree in School of Primary Education from University of Thessaloniki, and he has also studied at the University of Helsinki. His research interest is international and comparative education, teacher education policy and practice, analysis of education policy, education governance, and so on, so on, and so on. Please welcome Vasilis Simenodisis. <laughs> And the last person is professor of education, LT University of Budapest Faculty of Pedagogy and Psychology, Center for Higher Education and Innovation Research, Scientific Advisor, National Institute for Educational Research and Development. He teaches, among others, education policy Sociology of higher education, education and European integration, and global trends in education. This person is a head of a doctor school and has worked an, as an expert consultant for a number of international organizations, the European Commission and the OSD, the World Bank and the Council of Europe. Please welcome this 
person is Professor of Education Gabor Halas. Hello. Uh, well, my name is uh, Eystein, or uh, as I just uh, learned, I'm better known as Einstein in the international research community. Um, I teach uh, music. I become a music teacher educator at the Western Norway University of Applied Science. I've been doing that since uh, January, when my scholarship ended and I had to make money uh, by teaching. So I could easily identify with uh, what was just presented by Pat about uh, clearing the schedule to get time to keep on writing. So when I get back home, I'll open Outlook and look for next available spot in my calendar. But anyway, on behalf of the NAFOL students, I would like to say thank you to the hosts and organizers, both in ELTE, the EDITA Consortium, and in the NAFOL administration. Thank you for putting together an interesting program in such great surroundings as here in Budapest. The wonderful city surroundings reminds us of how privileged we are to be, to be members of uh, the research school. Some of us arrived um, some days before and some stay a couple of days longer to explore the city. Rumor has it that uh, the spa treatment is booked for some of the next couple of days, a perfect pit stop for aging PhD muscles before the final lap is approaching. Uh, now, there's only one seminar left for our cohort in NAFOL. And that reminds us of how important the programming of such seminars are for our professional development and for keeping us up to date as educational researchers. We meet international scholars who give us insight into perspectives outside of the Norwegian context. And after delivering their keynotes, the scholars give feedback and organize group discussions based upon our work. So as an awful member, I feel proud that what we have shared over two days in Budapest is uh, representative of the NAFOL seminars that we have experienced three to four times a year for the last four years. But this time it has been pleasant to get to know PhD candidates, not only for, from Europe, but also from the Far East and the US, and to get insights into what research question they pose and what problems seem important outside the boundaries of Norway. It has, for example, been interesting to get glimpses into gender issues linked to masculinity and attitudes towards learning disabil disabilities within the Polish context. At uh, the opening section yesterday, goals for these two days were set out. One was to enhance, to un enhance European cooperation. I think at a very small scale, we have realized European collaboration within the context of PhD education as we engage in each other's work and share of our own experiences, good and bad. So now, uh, when we go back, many of us will attempt, will attempt to finish our work. So let me remind you Formulate your personal mantra. Set up your daily plans using time and resource, resource management software. If you have to, lay down on the floor, facing the head towards your future goal, 
eventually, eventually you will get there. So thank you for inspiring days. Um, so from uh, the Edite perspective and as a representative of Edite, I wanted uh, to thank, first of all, the organizers for actually uh, implementing this great idea of bringing together two rather um, innovative um, projects and programs that foster this idea of research-based teacher education. So thank you, Kari. Thank you, Michael. Thank to the consortium, the Edite, the ELTE organizers. I think these uh, two days have been really great um, learning experiences from us, for us. I mean, these joint sessions that you have somehow been used to implement in NAFOL, as you saw also from the previous session, were very positively taken. And I think I speak by, uh, on the name of all Edite researchers, were very positively taken by us. It's something that uh, helped us to argue about our research, to think about the methodology, to get some insights, and uh, also to see how um, things uh, happen uh, in your program, to learn uh, from you, from your experiences. I was very uh, personally also uh, impressed um, about uh, the NAFOL um, cohort, the structure of your program, um, the fact um, that uh, you are all so um, bound uh, somehow to, to practice, that you come from the field of practice and that uh, your work is, is really related to what's happening in uh, schools. I was very, uh, and we were all glad to hear about your um, topics related to creativity, to improvisation, to motor skills, to exciting uh, phenomena that happen um, within the classrooms. And I hope you also uh, uh, got a feeling of uh, also of, of our research and of what Edite actually means as a um, international community of young scholars who come from very different parts of Europe and the world. And um, yeah, um, it was really a great experience these um, days. And I have to say that the time was not enough, actually. And uh, the point would be to think also of uh, future collaborations and uh, of continuing actually this uh, journey that we have just started, either uh, like uh, more strongly connecting uh, our two networks, but also through individual contacts. The point would be that, as Pavel said, to fight together in this uh, 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 fight uh, for research-based teacher education, and I think both projects have great potential and have a lot of things to offer to this uh, emerging European context uh, that we in Edita are working uh, very thoroughly into. So, thank you very much. Thank you. If you do not mind, I, I stay uh, sitting. Well, this conference has been part of the, the first part of the uh, one week uh, Editor Summer School. Uh, so those who belong to the Editor community will continue in the coming uh, uh, days. And the idea to organize this first part uh, in cooperation with uh, uh, NAFOL came from uh, uh, Curry at the uh, last summer school one year ago. And I remember that my immediate reaction uh, as the representative of the host university, my immediate reaction was uh, enthusiastic for several reasons. First, because uh, uh, working in cooperation is always fun. We like this. So then we had this opportunity to do something not alone, but 
working together with someone else. The second is that uh, me having international experiences in many countries, uh, uh, I have a great respect for Norway, the way Norway is uh, organizing education and the Norway approach to, to education. And the third is that uh, uh, we all uh, have a great respect for the academic work of, of uh, uh, Curry. So that was a wonderful idea, I think. And the idea to upgrade this first part into something that can be called a conference, which has a title uh, that was mainly the idea of the uh, ELTA team, uh, but our Norwegian partners were uh, uh, partners in, this, uh, in doing this. So now we are at the end of this conference part, the Edith and Nuffall conference, which uh, was discussing the theme of uh, doctoral education in teacher education, uh, European perspectives. When I opened the uh, conference uh, yesterday morning, uh, um, I uh, mentioned, it was projected on the screen, four goals. So if we are thinking back of these goals, the first one was enhancing European cooperation in doctoral education for improving teacher education. Well, this goal has not been difficult to achieve. So that, that was almost sure that uh, a common work of two doctoral schools uh, will achieve this goal. But there was one specificity that I would like to stress that uh, here, uh, 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 doctoral students have been invited to achieve uh, this goal. So they got a very active role, doctoral students in their last stage of uh, uh, studies. And this is symbolized by the fact that here there are three persons who are concluding, and two of them are doctoral students, and doctoral students were leading lots of elements of this program. So this European cooperation was done uh, in partnership with the, uh, the students under their control. Uh, the second goal was a better understanding of the emerging European context of teacher education. Well, I think that uh, uh, we can say that that was also uh, achieved. This has been supported especially by the, I would say, wonderful uh, uh, contribution of uh, Hannah, uh, uh, which provided uh, uh, a significant support for us to understand better the details of EU thinking policies and actions in education and in teacher education. Um, uh, but that was also supported by uh, by listening to uh, student fellows arriving from uh, another doctoral program and from different cultural contexts. Uh, the fourth goal was better understanding the role of doctoral education in improving teacher education. Uh, I think that we got a lot in that respect as well. Uh, 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 Curry's lecture today on research-based or or research-informed teacher education and the, and, the, and the deep and rich discussion this induced, uh, I think, made a major contribution to, to, to this. And finally, uh, the, the last goal that I mentioned was supporting our doctoral students in the final stage of their doctoral, student, or the doctoral studies. Uh, I think that uh, that was perhaps the most important goal of this uh, uh, conference and what I heard uh, from the uh, the reports of the four of the eight uh, groups uh, tells me that we achieved something uh, particular uh, what I would call a kind of augmented horizontal learning augmented horizontal learning I think that the same level of horizontal learning could have been realized uh, uh, without uh, uh, mixing the different student communities, uh, but it would not have been uh, reached such a level. So this uh, richness could be realized only because you came from different doctoral uh, schools. I think that uh, tomorrow when we shall have the, the, uh, the uh, supervisory meeting, 
we shall make a first uh, evaluation of the, of, the, of the conference. I hope that that will be positive and I also hope that we uh, shall discuss how, uh, what follow-up uh, we could have. So how we could uh, continue this cooperation which is definitely working. We could experience. Um, I think there are perhaps two extra achievements that uh, uh, I could add to those goals that I mentioned. Uh, one, one is a kind of evaluative self-reflection and self-monitoring of our progress. And the other one is, uh, uh, which was already mentioned, making uh, our doctor students our uh, partners, involving them in the management of the whole uh, conference. So I think that that was a successful conference and I would like to thank all uh, those who participated in uh, designing and realizing it, the presenters of the plenary session, uh, those who were moderating the plenary uh, mixed group sessions, those who were moderating the plenary events, those who uh, actively participated in the preparation and the realization of the conference, including the, the technical uh, staff, all editor and not all doctoral students who brought in the substance into our discussion, uh, and a special thanks to Kerry, uh, who not only initiated this program, but uh, has had a key role in conceptualizing it and uh, 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 designing all the small details. So I think that what we were doing here during the last two days, I would say that perhaps 80% of it came from your brain. <laughs> Um, and a special thanks to uh, Judith and Kinga. I see Judith and Kinga is there. Uh, so, so they were the soul and the energy behind everything that we uh, Got here, so thank you for uh, everybody, and I give back the floor to the to our chair. Thank you very much for all these wonderful words. And uh, before taking a common picture, uh, traditionally, the last word always belongs to our the head of Nafel School. Our mummy, <laughs> Curry.
in the Belgium, the Ghent University, just to see how it was done, to learn. So, thank you so much. You've done a wonderful job.